Hi, ladies, gentlemen, and marketers. My name is Sean Donnelly. I'm a research analyst at eConsultancy, and I spend my time there identifying and analyzing and evaluating marketing trends. Some of those trends have the potential to impact our sector and our organization and our jobs, and they can manifest themselves in new tools and tactics which require new skills. So demystifying these trends and the disciplines that emerge from them is a big part of my job. And in recent years, one of the strategic priorities that has surfaced consistently in a lot of the research that we've been doing has been customer experience. So I'm going to talk to you today a bit about customer experience. And of course, we can't talk about customer experience without discussing personalization. And we will talk about some models for scaling personalization. Much of the data and the guidance for this presentation comes from a report that we published late last year in partnership with Sitecore. It is a really good report. It has lots of good analysis, and so I would highly encourage you to download it. Now, I'm going to talk to you firstly a bit about the discipline of marketing, because as a science, if we want to call it that, it is a relatively new science. But digital ubiquity means that tactically, marketing has actually changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. Specifically, I'm referring to this convergence of digital and tr traditional marketing disciplines. And so in recognition of this, at eConsultancy, we have developed what we call the modern marketing model to identify the domains of modern marketing, because we don't think there should be digital marketing and there should be traditional marketing. There should just be marketing. And so you will observe in this model that we have uh, domains for strategy and tactics and branding, but we've also got modern domains like data and measurement and user experience, and of course, customer experience. Now our view at eConsultancy, if you allow me to define customer experience, is that it is the sum of all interactions that a customer has with our brand and their emotional response to those interactions. Why? Because we measure experiences in emotion. And it's really important to get this right because from a marketing point of view, if we want to focus marketing on driving intention to purchase, well, we have to consider that our audience has far less time and attention and trust to give to our marketing messages. So we need to become more precise and personalized in those messages in order to cut through. And so if we want to talk about customer experience, we need to move from thinking about who can we sell our products to and how can we convince them to buy, to focusing on customer first rather than channel first marketing. And that means thinking about questions like, what problems do we solve for our customers? Who has these problems? How can we address those problems? And how can we help those customers find out about our solutions? And so, Customer experience positions the role of marketers as stewards of customers through the customer journey from awareness through to advocacy and not just focusing on driving intention to purchase. So it's our view at eConsultancy that first class and personalized customer experience needs to be at the center of commercial strategies in the 2020s. It's vital for differentiation and increasingly for sustainability. If you allow me to quote Jeff Bezos, 22 years ago, he wrote in the Washington Post, if we have four and a half million customers, we shouldn't just have one store. We should have four and a half million stores. And so at the time he was talking about personalization at scale and Amazon and Amazon Prime has kind of become the benchmark that analysts point to in terms of a business that does customer experience and does personalization right. Now, one of my colleagues talks about Amazon, and he said, actually, Amazon are very good at convenience. They're very good at selling you your time back in the form of convenience because they have this personalized interface, but there might not necessarily be that emotional uh, res response or interaction that we have with a brand like Amazon. So we kind of need to move beyond that. And I guess, if we want to focus on improving customer experience, then we need to move into the space of delivering personalized experiences. And so to 
do that, we need to start organizing our marketing activities around the customer journey so that we can deliver those personalized interactions and compete on more than just price like Amazon. And so if we want to structure marketing around, say, our activities around a customer's decision journey, which might start with consideration where somebody considers an initial set of brands, we might not have as much data about the customer at this point. But then as brands and solutions enter and exit their consideration set at any point up to the, the point of purchase, they're in the evaluation stage. And this is where our marketing tactics like search engine marketing and user experience and content marketing come into play. Because this is when we can start to collect data signals, such as where traffic is being referred from and uh, monitoring on-site analytics, which can be very helpful to us. And then that can bring us to the moment of transaction, where for most brands, this is actually their first opportunity to start collecting first party data. Up until that point, we might not have that first party data. Now I mentioned marketing being about not just driving intention to purchase, but thinking about retention and cross-selling and so on. So the journey doesn't just end there. Modern marketers need to think beyond that driving attention to purchase piece, because if we get the product or the service experience wrong, our audience can curse us or, ad or they can advocate for us because brand after all, is just a distillation of experiences and reputation. So remember behind every one of these reviews is an experience that matters and an experience that can tell you something about how your customers interact with your brand and its products and can uncover opportunities to improve product positioning. And now that that person has, inter has transacted, hopefully then we can start to create a unified customer profile that we can use to maintain a longer term relationship with that person. And so personalization is very much a key driver in improving customer experience and to um, deliver those personalized interactions that can add value to our customer and ultimately deliver value back to our business. And so when we ask marketers in our research, what are the benefits of delivering personalization? They'll say things like, well, it informs customers decision-making and it helps reduce time to purchase. So from that initial, initial consideration phase through to transaction, and so can increase conversion rate optimization because it can help deliver more relevant and persuasive content. And so help drive things perhaps like impulse purchases or other conversions, the, whatever way we want to measure conversions, such as signing up for newsletters or booking appointments to speak with a salesperson and so on. And of course, the more personalized we can make the experience, then we can reduce the potential for returns and refunds. And that then increases the efficiency of our marketing spend, according to our research, by between 10 and 30%. And then of course, we do all that right, we'll increase customer satisfaction and trust, and ultimately increase revenue. Retail, in retail, for example, brands that can create personalized experiences, they report seeing a revenue increase of between six to 10%. And then beyond those functional benefits, I guess, there is that emotional benefit of lasting trust and customer loyalty, and thus reduced acquisition costs, particularly if somebody comes to transact with us again. So I attempted to build in some takeaways into this deck. So a lot of personalization is about creating great user experience, which can feel personal, even if it's not. So the task then is to develop intuitive and friction-free user experiences that feel personalized. And then we can think about personalization is something that we can apply throughout the customer journey. So a rule of thumb to think about is that the closer a customer gets to the point of purchase or beyond, the more data signals we'll have available to personalize that experience so that we can 
increase those conversion rates and reduce acquisition costs. And then back to that piece on reviews, customer experience leaders are very good at using user-generated content to surface operational and strategic insights and use those reviews, if they're good reviews, as user-generated marketing collateral on their website and in their advertisements. So to put seemingly personalized user experience into context, I like how the French brand L'Occitan uses implicit signals on their website. And by implicit signals, I mean things like browsing habits such as search phrase and campaign source and referring pages and so on. So they use this data to segment people on their site based on their behavior. So they do things like identifying click patterns to serve relevant and timely messages. So for example, if somebody adds something to their basket, but then displays abandoning behavior, then they can fire a layer with an image of the chosen product and some kind of nudge message like what you can see here in front of you. And these experiences in the UK anyway, have driven a 2.65% uplift in revenue per visitor, which you can imagine when you think about all of those visitors that transact, that's a significant amount on the bottom line. And we'll talk a little bit about explicit signals from people later on in terms of transaction history. So let's talk about putting personalization into practice. It can be quite difficult to create a definitive framework for implementing customer experience, but there are a number of elements that need to be in place, and we're going to go through these now one by one. So let's start with strategy. So it's easy to think about customer experience as a conceptual thing and as something that impacts everybody in an organization, which means quite often it can be left without having a defined strategy. In fact, we find that some marketers, they prefer to focus on the less abstract things like building campaigns. But in practice, customer experience really needs to be defined. And this includes discovering what our customers consider to be great customer experience and understanding the customer journey so that we can identify those channels and touch points where our brand needs to be present and ready to transact. And that means setting clear KPIs for all of those different touch points, because after all, what we can't measure, we can't manage, to use that old phrase. We need leadership buy-in for customer experience so that we can ensure collaboration within the organization, because that's often the biggest choke point. Ultimately, it's the CEO that can nominate somebody uh, to be in charge of customer experience, somebody like the CMO or the head of marketing who can lead a working party. And then customer experience, it needs to be built into strategy because it's not something that is delivered in a single execution. It's a long-term process. And so as a result, outcomes are not often immediately apparent. Now it's our view, I think we made it clear, but that CMOs should lead this. Now it turns out the challenges in delivering customer experience and personalization are actually quite similar. So let's go through these one by one. So leadership buy-in is a challenge and proving that business case. Um, so our, in terms of a solution, we need to position these activities as strategic activities and not tactical activities. So that means presenting the advantages of personal personalization that we've just discussed and the role of things like customer lifetime value, which we'll discuss in a moment. We've got other challenges like poor data quality. Now the key to good personalization is data. And so we need to audit our data to check how up to date it is. We can't talk about data these days without talking about third party cookie blocking, which means that it's a good idea to invest in first party data. And we're seeing a lot of this from enlightened companies. Scaling personalized experiences is a challenge, particularly due to poorly connected data. So our solution then is, can we, can it be brought together into um, a central tool to surface insights? So to do that, if we want to invest in some kind of tool or technology, then we need also to support our marketers with the skills that they need around data management and governance. And, we might also need to invest in, in terms of talking about 
technology, uh, things like machine learning to analyze huge volumes of data at scale that human beings just don't know how to do. Now, where can we start with all this? We need clear goals with defined success metrics to formulate a clear program of activity. So let's talk about people. CX is one of those things. We mentioned that it can be abstract in some organizations. So that means that it, there aren't always defined lines of responsibility, and that can be a problem. Our view is that marketing is the distinguishing unique function of any business. And so that positions marketers as people who need to spearhead any kind of collaboration. So let's look at that. Effective CX and personalization implementation requires a whole organization approach. And when it comes to marketers, they might be the ones that are deemed to have the closest relationship with the customer, which positions them as people who can lead a working party to anchor CX and personalization in business reality. And they can work closely with sales because of course, better marketing creates better leads for salespeople who also need to be equipped with the skills to deliver value at each phase of the sales cycle. And then marketers might need to have influence if not responsibility over service related activities because service oriented thinking is associated with brand, but it's also often where customer experience gaps are exposed. So that frontline execution of strategy requires those employees to understand what the company is trying to achieve. And this is a message that needs to be communicated to them by marketing. And that's similar for operational staff. In fact, operational and service staff, um, they should be consulted for their feedback on how to improve customer experience because quite often they have invaluable insights. Then we've got things like research and development and HR, so research and development, because they can help us understand customer value through insights programs where we can integrate that learning back into our marketing and our sales and our service and operations and product. And to some extent, some of this kind of filters through HR because they manage employee experience and they're uh, responsible for communicating CX and brand values as they hire people and ensure people have the right mindset to deliver that uh, customer ex experience success. Now we talked about collaboration and organizational alignment. And you'll observe here in our research, when we look at what we call customer experience leaders, which are organizations that outperform their competitors, they're far more likely to have teams that collaborate across functions to ensure uh, consistency of experience throughout the customer journey. And they're also more likely to have an organizational structure that prioritizes customer journeys over functional silos. So that's an interesting piece of insight. In terms of organizational structure, enlightened companies are taking an open innovation approach and are creating uh, cross-functional project teams to bring collaboration and flexibility and velocity to ways of working. Such teams are useful if you need to pivot to meet changing conditions. So they can contain people like project managers and specialists, including strategists and designers, uh, marketing technologists, data specialists, um, service people, of course, and communications people. Most interesting, I think, about some of these people is that while they are responsible for marketing, some of them are quite are specialists and they might not necessarily identify themselves as marketers, but they have a role to play in marketing. Again, I'm kind of putting forward this idea that marketers might need to influence or lead beyond their authority. In the most progressive organizations that we work with, they are structuring these teams either around customer segments or different kinds of customer centric need states. So what are our takeaways from this section? Well, we can expect marketers to remain at the head of the CX agenda, but organization-wide collaboration is important. So this is where the C-suite comes in because they can, I guess, convey the cost of non-compliance 
All staff need to understand their internal value proposition and we need to create cross-functional teams so that we can break down operational and data silos that can prevent that sort of joined up approach to customer experience and enable personalization at scale across those different touch points. So that brings us to process because CX initiatives require long-term thinking. And so we need to break things down into multiple phases. So it's important to have validation points, which brings us to process. And in terms of process, it's worth starting with mapping out the customer journey, because we need to map out that customer journey in order to um, identify customer pain points at different kinds of channels, because there's this challenge that a lot of businesses have nowadays that the collection of data has become a double-edged sword. They have found themselves optimizing channels without considering the wider customer journey. So the key focus here is to focus on the customer journey and then we can start to manipulate that channel activity accordingly. Now, this organizational mindset is not easy. Here's a baseline for you. In most jurisdictions, you'll observe that less than half of marketers that we surveyed say that their organization has people dedicated to evaluating and improving customer experience throughout the customer life cycle. And so to map the customer journey and optimize those experiences, we need to start by defining our customer. So we talked about the consideration and the evaluation stage. We might not be, be able to deliver those one-to-one -one interactions at scale yet. So we need to create personas. And personas are just fictional characters created from insights to bring clusters of people to life, I guess. And so journey mapping projects, they're typically um, start with identifying the customer journey, or excuse me, identifying the customer persona, but then bringing together that cross-functional team again that can consist of colleagues that can represent the voice of the customer, in particular, marketing and sales reps. And then of course, again, senior leaders that can provide that stewardship. And now, there are a number of measure. There are a number of metrics that can measure customer experience and it's vital to choose metrics that can be mapped back to easily identifiable business metrics. So for customer service driven brands, customer satisfaction scores are a useful insight. For organizations that want to gauge loyalty, NPS can be beneficial. But the e-consultancy view is that firms should focus on customer lifetime value as well as some of those other metrics. Because after all, CX is a long-term process, not a single execution. And so we need to have a methodology for calculating CLV, because if we can't calculate customer lifetime value, then we don't know how to optimize for it. And it becomes more difficult then to evaluate some of those other KPIs in context. So what are the third section? We can start by auditing our internal workflows to check if there's room for agility. There may not be enough data to create segments of one at scale. So it's important to create those customer personas. And once we do that, then we can start to map the customer journey to identify customer pain points. Those pain points will be opportunities that we can use to improve the journey and then manipulate channel activity accordingly. Our KPIs should be aligned with our business goals. And back to CLV, we need leadership to create that model for CLV so that we can focus on that rather than prioritizing short-term profitability. In fact, it's a metric that is probably even more important right now as retention displaces acquisition as a key priority in many organizations. So added to the number of channels and the increasing pressure on marketers to understand um, how those channels interact is this pressure to understand how a lot of new technology can be used and applied, and it's a new level of skill that maybe wasn't even required a decade ago. So 
To deliver CX management and personalization effectively requires utilizing data. And that means we need to think about how we architect our tech stacks and our data flows. And it is something that is really difficult to do well, but it's also really important. And so you'll observe that we asked marketers about their approach to marketing technology. And you'll see that our CX leaders, they're more likely to have a highly integrated and cloud-based technology stack. And the right stack, it's important, not just for our marketing communications, but also for managing privacy and data management and governance, which can no longer be afterthoughts for forward-looking companies. And here's another baseline for you. You'll observe that only a third of marketers globally say that they are confident that their new marketing technology will be staffed properly. Now that's something that we'll come back to in a moment. Let's look at how organizations are managing their data. Well, our leaders are doing a better job of auditing their data supply chains. By that, I mean examining where data comes in and where it exits the system, because that's a useful exercise for illuminating what data is available and how it's being used. And number two, leaders have a clear emphasis on capturing first party data. And this all requires architecting technology stacks and data flows. And so we're going to need the right tools to help us do this, which can be incredibly difficult. But to deliver personalization programs at any scale, we need to have the right technology and we, we might need to train marketers in order to utilize all that technology. So there's a question there, is it a marketer's job to do this or is it the technologist's job? So we've attempted to come up with a framework to help with this. So deciding how marketing technology needs to be managed is something that marketing leaders have to grapple with, but with the support of their CTO colleagues. So here's the guidance. Marketers need to be able to use the technology in their strategy and tactics, but the technology heavy lifting can remain part of IT, or we might have an interface role, that of, if we call them the marketing technologist here, who is somebody who will report into the CMO because that's where the technology is being used, but they might also have a, a dotted line into the CTO or CIO. And this is a role that is becoming increasingly valuable because it's this person's job to make sure that that data supply chain that we we're talking about is set up and able to deliver that personalization at scale. So in terms of a model for personalization, if we want to put that together and start thinking about tailoring communications based on different data signals, let's start with contextual data or top of funnel data. So this is where data might be limited, so we might need to identify opportunities where more simple personalization can be achieved using contextual signals like domain and IP geolocation. So to put that into context, the home page is a place where personalization can have a big effect. So in this case, here's British retailer Very. They're using demographic and weather-based signals to customize the look and feel of their homepage to support visitors to shop more weather appropriate products. And you'll see in this case, here they are serving kind of more summertime appropriate uh, content. And I guess the thing to think about here is that brands can serve millions of versions of their homepage to customers, depending on the signals that we have available to us. Now, the more data points provided by the customer, the better we can customize the experience with relevant content and ads. So beyond contextual targeting, we can start to look at how people behave and what this might tell us about how we might engage with them. So we mentioned French brand L'Occitane and how they use on-site behavior to surface relevant content. But then there are also brands like the erotic retailer Ant Summers, and they utilize weather-based personalization, but they also adjust content based on on-site behavior. So for example, if somebody is on their site and keeps coming back to the site and looks at the same content or same product more than three times without purchasing, then they might be categorized as a nervous buyer. 
And so we can start to serve them adapted content on their next viewing to help them um, move further along in that customer journey. And this is a brand that also segments new visitors from old visitors. So they'll only serve these kind of discount uh, vouchers to, to new visitors. Why is this interesting? Because it's a nice way of collecting first party data. So the key point here is that this is all quite considered customer experience and it supports our customers to get closer tr to transacting and it feels personal. Now, when a customer completes a transaction or sets up an account, then we can start to use that declared data to create unified customer profiles to record things like purchase behavior, value by spend, price sensitivity, and so on. Um, and if we have invested in the right experience platform, then we can start to delivering this one-to-one -one personalization, which is the ultimate goal. If you're not familiar with EasyJet, it is probably Europe's leading airline. Last year, it served about 55 million customers. And if I share my data at the start of an exchange um, with EasyJet, then I can get a more personalized user experience and more personalized recommendations. So why is this interesting? We're back to that uh, definition I had about explicit signals. I can share these explicit signals in exchange for being able to check in and get my boarding pass, add or change seats, all things that, that I'm going to start that slide again. EasyJet is Europe's leading airline, serves about 55 million passengers a year, or at least it did last year. And if I share my data with EasyJet, then they can deliver a personalized user experience to me and personalized recommendations. So this is interesting because this is the explicit signals that I was talking about earlier on where I can share my data in return to be able to do things like check in and get boarding passes, add or change seats. Um, and EasyJet can use that data to improve my customer experience and personalize my experience. And this happens to be one of their strategic goals because if they can improve customer experience and therefore boost loyalty, then they can go beyond just competing on price and being a low uh, price airline. And to do that though, they need to become more data driven. So to achieve this, they've been improving their data capability in the form of technology investment and key hires and so as well as doing things like updating their content management system to customize content for visitors from, I think, over 200 different countries with relevant information, they've also invested in automation and experience management tools. And they've supported this investment by hiring and deploying people with the right skills to utilize that technology. So, for example, in 2018, they restructured their marketing department to focus on data. So that included hiring a digital director and a head of loyalty with a view to utilizing their data to personalize experiences so well that people would use a site for full travel planning, not just for booking sites. So what are the results of this? Well, last year, their site was recognized in the UK by the UX UK Awards. Okay, you might say, so what? Well, they've also been able to start dynamically incorporating their site into their other digital campaigns and so reducing their acquisition costs. And more importantly, last year, they were able to um, increase overall conversions to bookings by about 6%. So that is quite significant. Doing all of that requires a lot of data integration, which can be a big issue. In fact, for two thirds of marketers, they describe the capability with data integration as being poor or fair. So we published a framework last year that attempts to split data access and usage from where it is stored, freeing data for multiple uses with speed and ease of access. So if we look at this from right to left, we've got segment data where we can start to understand and prioritize those valuable customer segments and where to focus our tactics around 
those segments. Remember, we're talking about personas. But then as we start to collect more data, we can build out profiles because this is really our goal to create this holistic view of the customer. Um, but that takes time and it takes first party data um, so that we can start to track things like customer history and so on. The better we get at that, then we can start to build prediction models, most likely supported by machine learning that can analyze structured and unstructured data generated by our campaigns and different interactions to do things like work towards predicting customer behavior and influencing their behavior perhaps by things like targeted messaging. If we can do all of that right, then hopefully we can start to foster loyalty and minimize customer churn. And then finally, we've got our metadata. So that's where we get to the macro view, and building out that metadata for wider context about touch points tracked that might give us insights into creating new solutions or products or services. And again, all this can be supported by machine learning, which in fact permeates all of our enterprise activities, um, particularly a lot of the marketing tools that we might use these days. So our final set of takeaways, audit your technology stack to examine how data is coming in and where it exits and how it is being used. Use your contextual and your behavioral signals to adapt and serve um, customers in the moment. So this can be enhanced again by machine learning. So things that can feel personalized, even though they might not be. And then activate a comprehensive personalization strategy um, using integrated marketing technology and advertising technology to help us combine our first and our second and our third party data key question i guess here is to consider whether disparate tools and platforms can be used but they might need to be stitched together which can be a resource heavy endeavor or should there be a focus on a more unified technology setup so that's my presentation my contact details are there feel free to get in touch with me and i've also put in some resources for you to download as well thank you <music>